I'm Josh Welsh, President of Film Independent, and welcome to a very special evening with Emily Blunt. I'm, I'm going to be very brief to, to hold myself back from gushing, but I just want to say all of us at Film Independent are such huge fans of, of Emily and her work, and we could not be happier uh, and more grateful to have her here tonight and to be able to celebrate her incredible body of work. And um, I won't go into a long list of credits, but I will mention things like um, uh, Mary Poppin Returns, Sicario, The Edge of Tomorrow. Um, there was a fantastic show that she was on last year called The English on Amazon, which if you haven't seen, I highly recommend. So many incredible performances, and really it's an honor to, to be here tonight uh, to celebrate her career. Um, I think a lot of you are probably Film Independent members, so I won't do a whole song and dance about that, but if you're not a member, Film Independent, we are an organization based here in LA that believes we, we love movies and the, the wildly talented people who make them, the good ones. And uh, if, if we're an open access membership organization, we produce the Spirit Awards, an award show. It's a week or so before another uh, award show that happens uh, in town, maybe affiliated with this building. Um, and if you'd like to vote on the winners of the Spirit Awards, just join Film Independent by December the 18th. Um, with that, the other incredibly exciting element of tonight is Emily is going to be in conversation with an incredibly talented filmmaker who we are also huge fans of at Film Independent. And I will just say, Chicago, Memoirs of a Geisha, Mary Poppins Returns, please join me in welcoming the extremely talented Rob Marshall. <laughs> wow, ooh, this is great. Look at all these people. Oh, thank you. Um, I have to say this is such a joy for me to be here because this is one of my favorite people on the planet. I adore her so much. Um, we're such great friends. But also, I, I'm, you know, she's going to hate me for saying this, but I, I'm going to say it anyway. She's one of the greats. She's one of the greats. And um, it's a short list. It's a short list. And she's on it. I mean, it's so, you know, it might seem a little early for her to have a career retrospective like this tonight. But when you see already at this age the range, the exquisite work, the breathtaking um, infusion of humanity she brings to every role, you will see that, um, you know, it's okay that we're having this tonight because it's, 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 it's time. Um, I'd love for you, before we bring her out, just to take a look at some of this exquisite work which we'll talk about this evening. I'm so thrilled to be here. How great were those clips? I mean, for me, you see the range is extraordinary, M. It just is extraordinary. You look at that and you think, what can't you do? What have you not done? And this is when I was saying before that you're one of the greats, and I truly mean that. You know, when you think of Katharine Hepburn and Rosalind Russell. Best I know. And we know each other. <laughs> <laughs> and Maggie Smith, right? And Meryl. Right? Oh, you can't. Not all of them. <laughs> Not all of them. All of them. That's, that's, your, that's your league. That's who you are. Do, do people know that? I hope people know that. That's, where, that's what you are. When you see the range up there, when you see you move from, and this is fun because we get to talk about this now. <laughs> get to talk about all the different movies and, and the range. and it, 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 it's, it's kind of extraordinary. And is it something... I mean, we'll talk about it for sure, but is it something that is conscious for you, like to do different things, have different Yes, I, I mean, yes, I think I look for that um, terror of the unknown maybe every time. Mm. Um, and what that feels to put your feet to the fire every time and do something that might be out of character or, or left of center or... Um, unreachable in some way at first glance, you know. I think I like to feel that. Um, 
and and to try not to repeat, you know. Well, what's consistent about everything you do for me is that there is a humanity, a relatability. We see ourselves through you. And it's so honest. It's what every actor dies to have, Aww. to find that kind of honesty and truth in what you do. And, and you know, it's, it, 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 sometimes, it, you know, people see it and, and don't see fully what it is. It's the hardest thing to do. Um, you know, I'm going to go a little out of order tonight, just a little bit. Go. Because, because, well, just because <laughs> I real well, I just, I want to start with Oppenheimer. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's fresh. <laughs> well, know? it's fresh. <laughs> um, it certainly is fresh. I will say it's one of the most searing, astounding performances I've ever seen. It just is because, because you are like a laser. It, you know, it's not like there's tons of screen time. You come on and, I mean, I'm, now I'm, I'm going to drop a name because I, I was with her last night. Um, I was with Meryl Streep last night, and, and I mean, not with her, with her. <laughs> <laughs> I was having dinner with Meryl, <laughs> and your ears were burning because we were talking about you. And we were saying, she was just, she just said, um, she's overwhelmed by your performance in that film. She wrote me the most heart-stopping email about it. Because she feels it deeply, and she knows. She knows. And, you know, when you, it, it, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a complicated layered part because she's so brilliant, this woman that you play, and she's so um, damaged and, and crying for help. I mean, Meryl said, you know, it happens to the women of that era. That's right. They're pushed yeah. into the kitchen or wherever they were, you know, pushed aside, you know, from what their brilliance is. That's right. How did you, first of all, how did it come to you? How did that film come to you? Well, um, I got a, a call that Chris Nolan wanted to meet, you know, and I thought, do I have a jetpack to get there as quickly as possible? Because I was just so excited to meet him and a bit intimidated, probably, because he is sort of that tremendously intimidating brain that you think he will have and will that materialize in a sort of rather cold person? And he was the opposite. He was warm and lovely and funny and sort of loves a gossip and you're like <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just amazing it's not what you expect and so we talked for um an hour or so and then in the most understated way which is just his way he goes uh you know i'd like you to play the part of kitty oppenheimer and if you'd like to have a look then you know i'd l love you to do it and i was like <laughs> like, I just didn't even know I was getting an offer. Like on that, it was just amazing. So I read this extraordinary pulse racing script, um, and for those of you who've seen it, 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 how it plays is how it was written. Mm. The extraordinary intercutting and interwoven narratives, and um, the way he was able to—it's like he loves the physicality of film and. The fact that you were able to see visually these uh, chaotic visions in Killian's brain, and like it was just so extraordinary. And he's able to actually like photograph unharnessed energy that would dis potentially destroy the world we live in. I mean, it was just staggering. And I think maybe because Chris is such a brilliant filmmaker, we forget what an extraordinary writer he is, you know. And it blew me away. He we talked a little more about the part and then I think very much like you, you know, he, he loves actors. He's, he loves them. He's so curious about what you might do. And I remember that with you well, in as your well. hands, in your hands, he knows this is a smart man. He well, knows. I think he just, he, he, I think probably what happens with Chris Nolan is he goes after his first choice and everyone says yes. So it's <laughs> like, <laughs> His um his scripts, I don't know if you guys knew this, are written on red paper. Apparently you can't photocopy red paper. Really? Something to think about. Wow. I gotta get some I didn't think they sell that at Staples. <laughs> I haven't seen red paper <laughs> anywhere. So he writes on red paper and Downey always said he feels like it's like a kind of hypnotic colour, so everyone says yes. I was like, no, I mean they say yes because it's Chris Nolan. But um I loved her. I thought she was 
so powerful, so fiery, all sharp edges. But I, I'm always interested in the shadow of someone's life. Like, why do they become that way? And like Meryl was saying to you last night, you know, I have so much empathy for those women who were meant for colossal intellectual endeavors and got squandered at the ironing board and festered with frustration and regret. And um, I think she drove herself insane in the isolation and loneliness of Los Alamos. Of course she was gonna resort to these kind of crutches that she did. And apparently the Oppenheimers threw um, dinner parties, but there was no dinner. It was just martinis, that was <laughs> it. It was just <laughs> martinis and cigarettes. That sounds like my kind of day. Um, <laughs> but it, so, I mean, to me, when I see it, it's, 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 you're like an Olympian because you, because you have this, it's so economical. And you, when you're on screen, you have to go right there. I mean, it happens right there in the moment. It's not like you're building up to it. It's hap it happens, and, and, and it's such a, I mean, to come into the film like that, the way that you do, it's so brutally honest. It's just beautiful to watch. It is masterful, Thanks. masterful. Thanks. And not even like discussing the interrogation scene at the end where we see you transition from, I mean, you know, from so vulnerable and so, you know, not together. Well, it's just such a wonderful scene, you know, and in many ways like a great setup because you've got a character who's deteriorated so much and has lost so much dignity and has become so volatile and sort of unpredictable that you maybe think she's going to choke there in the room. You all, we're all on pins and needles. We're yeah. Like, because we love you. See, this is, this is what I just want to <laughs> say about your work. It, you, you love you. No matter what you do. I love me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, Em. You bring that out in people. We, f it's you, you, you're, we, we can see ourselves through you. How do you prepare for something like that, like that scene you were just describing? How that, like how, so it's the day of. So yeah. what happens? I mean, we actually, we shot the wides the night before and you know, sometimes those scenes are a bit of a stagger through and you're like sort of marking it. But I felt at that point that set had become a very well-oiled machine. And the thing that had been helpful to me as a character was watching all of these people come in and testify and not stand up for him. Wow. So I think I'd seen all of these people come in and just drag him across the coals. and. I love that Killian Murphy so much. <laughs> I, I love him so deeply. He's so extraordinary. And as a human being, as a person, but in this part. And I'd seen this man become a shell of his former self. Even as I sat there, mainly like out of focus for most of the, out of focus, Chris <laughs> Nolan, <laughs> for most of the testifies in it. <laughs> so I'd sort of, seen Killian's Oppenheimer just uh, crumble into dust, really. And I think that was helpful to me. So by the time I got up to do my scene, and it's probably because Jason Clark is the most unbelievable bad guy ever yes, in that scene. He's uh, such a bully and he's so brilliant. Um, that maybe by the time it was time to do the scene, I just wanted to rip his face off and <laughs> it was really great. And, and then on the day, um, you know, and again, Chris is so understated, like there's never this sort of ceremonious, this is a big scene sort of energy on set. It's like, all right, we've got the camera up. Yeah, ready? Okay, um, yeah, good, uh. okay. Yeah. And it's just really non-chaotic and just wonderful in that way. So we were ready to do it and then Jason said, I think I'm gonna move my chair in really close to her. And I think I thought that was a really cool move and it also created a reaction in me because I found it like sort of toxic, misogynistic move, you know, mm. to try and physically intimidate you and and it really got my back up, you know. I mean, the thing is it's, it's you know, th and this is so true of what you do, you never show off for show off sake. And we've seen those performances, big time. I, <laughs> <laughs> I have. <laughs> and 
I'm telling Go you. Go on, talk shit. Tell him. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just us, so we can. <laughs> but, but I feel like you just land it. You're, and this is so. It's just, and I've witnessed this as a, your director. You just come in. It's so immediately in the groove. It is so honest and so truthful immediately. And I've seen actors literally say to you, "I don't understand them how you're doing that." Like I'm searching for it, finding it, looking for it, trying the next take, and you're just there. And that's what I mean by an Olympian. I think of you that way. You're in there. You 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 come in. You are prepared. You, but it, but also at the same time, it's so, it, it feels so spontaneous. It's this incredible, masterful thing you do, and no one does it, M. But I will say, it is it's it's a, any kind of spontaneity is is only, um, only has space for that kind of thing when you have a director who's curious, you know, and interested and trusts you and wants to see what else you have and what's in your bag of tricks and not every director does that you know some some can make you freeze up a bit well here here's what i love about and this is true of uh, all the performances we'll talk about this evening but you know you paint outside the lines like i you give every color you know, like you use every single color in the paint box so if you're supposed to be this kind of person Y we see other colors. We see all the colors. But I feel, you know, and that's very nice, as you can say. I mean, you you know me, Rob, and it's, it's. She hates never, this so much. This is no, horrible for her. You will never have so much smoke <laughs> blown up your ass than you will by Rob Marshall. I mean, I didn't need the umbrella on Mary Poppins. I would have just flown, like no. truly. I mean, and he would do it also on the God mic we had that we had on set. In front of the British crew, it was my favorite thing. The who were just, you know, the Brits, like, we just, we don't do this, right? <laughs> and he would get on the mic and be like, M, it is just <laughs> incredible. And you see the British crew were like. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, it's so easy with you. No, That's the thing. It's so simple. I can't even remember <laughs> what I was going to say, but like. Um, well, it's, listen, it, it, it's true. But it's true, and it's so but easy to call it out. But what you about, you know, the, the, the range of every moment. I just, no moment is about one thing. No, yeah, no, no one, not, no, no yeah, one but, sentence but, but is just but about one thing. But there are you know? so few actors that do that. They play a quality, and they play it from beginning to end. And that's, they're sort of doing their Name thing. Name them who do I, it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here comes the, no. Um, but it really, but that's what's amazing about you. You always surprise. You always surprise me. And it's so human and so truthful. People are surprising. I think I'm mm. always surprised by people all the time. And one moment is about a myriad of different things. Mm. And so I think it's my job to try to um, play that, really. Mm. Because, uh, you know, people will say something or they'll ask you a question and it won't necessarily be as direct as as the question. It will be about other things. And you see that and you use that. That's the genius. And um, and congratulations on your Golden Globe nomination Thank and your you. Critics' Choice nomination. Thank which you it, very and there's much. and there's so much more to come, this thing. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna jump back now, just a few years. <laughs> Let's go way back, just for a moment. <laughs> oh, I just wanna I mean I, it's such an auspicious beginning to your career to be in the royal family, directed by Sir Peter Hall, on the West End, yeah. playing Judy Dench's granddaughter in the royal family. So, how does that how does that happen? It does. I mean, uh, how does that happen? How do you get? How is that your debut? I mean, it, I I was very lucky because you know, um, and, and it's a terrible thing to say as an English actor. I I didn't train, you know, which is I was so embarrassed about saying in England because. It was like a big no-no, like everyone went to drama school. And um, I landed my uh, UK agent when I was 17, and he came to see a school play I did. And so when I turned 18, I uh, he tried to get me in to audition for Peter Hall, and the casting director said, no, he's only seeing people who've been to drama school. And Roger Charteris was like, no, trust me, she's, she's great. Like, you've got to see, he begged and begged and begged and begged. No, 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 for the longest time. And eventually he agreed to see me. And so I auditioned for Peter Hall. And, and were you intimidated? I mean, very, very, you and know. how was Judy with you? Unbelievable. Really? A godsend. Really? Like the launch into 
trying to do it the right way, you know, because the business is so overwhelming and maybe the worst thing you can do is take it too seriously all the time. And she's so joyful and she's so funny and naughty and <laughs> would go out of her way to make me laugh on stage. Like every night uh, we would be crying with laughter on stage and corpsing and it was just heaven. And she was gracious and kind to me and she'd bring me into her dressing room every night and like Johnny Depp would be there and Pierce Brosnan <laughs> would be there. And I was like, <laughs> like it was just so amazing. But you know? I think she saw a kindred spirit. I think she saw someone. Oh, she was you know. so, so wonderful to me. Yeah. Uh, so then what's interesting is your first sort of major film, I would say, is My Summer of Love. Yeah. And have you any have, have people seen that film? It's 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 pretty extraordinary. It really is. It's extraordinary. Mom, are you here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like shocked well, when people have seen it. I mean, it is a beautiful film. It's a it's beautiful the film. Great Pavel Pavlikovsky, who's yes, just in incredible. Incredible. I mean, the it's a complicated movie, and it's um, and your character is incredibly dense. You know, I I, I mean, it, it was surprising. Kind of a nasty girl. She's nasty, and she nasty. plays games, and she does those kinds of things. But, but it's really very layered. But you know that. It's I mean, I always kind of, I kind of based her on. There are those girls. You guys know those girls in high school, and there's like a light around them, and you just want to be a part of their mm. world, and they're not always very nice. Yeah. But you, th I was obsessed with some girls in my class. I was like, wow, like, and you didn't know. At that age, it's like you didn't know if you wanted to be them or be with them or like, it was just, they were so magnetic. And so I, she was sort of based on a couple of girls I went to school with and, and liked toying with people. There was something exciting well about Well, you that. understood it. And once again, even in the clip, you know, you see it's, you're, it, you bring humor to it too. You f that's what I mean by finding all the colors. It's so consistent in all your work, even then. Mm. And it's a brave I mean, it's very, very brave. Very brave. I mean, for very what risky. you were able to, so you must have felt you could trust. I mean, here you are really in your first lead role, really, yeah. and and carrying a film. I mean, I was very scared uh, d working like that. It was all improvised. Even the audition, like See, when I went to audition for Pavel, um, it was the scariest audition because it, I knew it would be an improv audition. <laughs> 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 I went in there and... He's amazing, Pavel. And he goes, okay, so I want you to look out the window and uh, you see your dad and he's like fucking his secretary. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And he goes, and you got to like get very, very mad, like very angry and then cry and then pretend the whole thing's a joke and laugh. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, okay, go. <laughs> and, and it was so scary, you know, it was just so scary to have to do it. And I, I remember thinking I'd completely blown it. And and then he he asked me to come back and read with Natalie, who played the other girl, who was so extraordinary. And But the whole film, it was so free-spirited. It was so... I'd just come from English television, you know, I hadn't worked like that. And we would sometimes wait for magic hour, for the wow. most perfect light. It was just the most art artistic thing I'd... What about the of. size of performance? I mean, coming from theater, and how did you know film? I mean, to me, well, I didn't. I mean, I, I, I remember the first TV thing I did was this um, <laughs> TV show called Boudica about Boudica, the warrior queen. I was like covered in blue woad all the time <laughs> with <laughs> bad braids. But um, uh, we shot in Romania. I remember I was doing my first scene ever on film with this lovely actor. His name was Gideon. Gideon was so nice. And I was really projecting, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he just goes, um, this is like when it boom is, it, you, you can whisper <laughs> and it will <laughs> hear you. And I was so embarrassed because I'd just come from, you know, yelling. So. But you learn it quick. I mean, that's what's yeah. great. You're instinctive and that's what you see. And you won the Evening Standard Award for Most Promising Newcomer. And that was really exciting, Emma. That I mean, you just knew that you were heading in that direction. And I'm, I'm just going to jump to, um, a television piece that you did, but it, it got you so much acclaim and you won you a Golden Globe, which was Gideon's Daughter, yeah. which is, have you seen that? It's exquisite. It, her work is so beautiful and it's really a, a tale of forgiveness, I would say, in a way. Yeah. You know, forgiving the sins of your, your father. Your father. And, yeah. and, and you sang in that. I mean, yeah. the re one of the reasons I found out about <laughs> that is when I did my detective work to see <laughs> Emily Bullitt could sing, you know, because there's not a lot of, you know, you're like, 
who you know you're looking when I'm doing a musical like and um and it's scary to Yes, sing. but what's beautiful about that and this is interesting about about singing in film because you know people sing and then there are people that act and then there are people that don't know how to put those two things together. And what's so incredible about that song in that television piece is that you are you it's uh, your whole relationship with your father is in that song. Yeah. I mean, I think it was called My Papa or something like that, some yeah, song. Exactly. And, and but, but, but you knew how to deliver that. How did you, I mean, a lot of people can't do that, Em. How do you well, do that? Well, the song, I mean, uh, Stephen Polyakov was really, you know, he, he said you need to sing the entire thing directly at him. And wow. there was so much animosity between and me. This is Bill Nighy, by the Bill way. Bill Nye, who's just so extraordinary amazing. actor. And just such a wonderful person. And so, yeah, I had to sort of shoot daggers at him while I sang it. And um, But there's also love in your eyes, too. See, that's the thing. It's this kind of combination. We're so tortured, the relationship. And the, 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 the idea that when you start to lose touch of your child or your teenager and how scary that is for a parent and when you can't access them anymore. And um, I think a lot of parents go through that when their kids hit the teenage years and they lose them for a second. It's terrifying. And um, yeah, it was, it was sort of ha a heartbreaking moment. And I did love doing that scene. But as you know, I avoided auditioning for you for a while because I was so scared <laughs> to sing in front of you. Which is you. ridiculous. No, but you especially, because I think, no. yes, <laughs> you. <laughs> And I remember, Rob knows this, that when he was auditioning people for Nine, I said no. And I rem my agent, Chris, is sitting here. And Chris... Yeah, Chris, I'm going to kill you <laughs> for that one. <laughs> and, and I said no. And Chris, I don't know how you got this memo, but Chris had heard that I was supposed to bring my jazz shoes. No, this is such a lie. And I was <laughs> like, over my dead body. Like, that, I, I would we rather drink bleach than do that. Yeah. I was like, I don't want to so do no it. Nicole Kidman brought her jazz shoes. I mean, what and are you she talking about? She nailed it. <laughs> yeah, and she was amazing. So when I told Rob that, Rob was like, jazz shoes? I never what? Asked for jazz shoes. Okay. So I don't know. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't want to do it. And then by the time Into the Woods came around, I said no again. And Chris called me. And Rob had called you. And he See. said, she's coming in. You, yeah, and you're forgiven, Chris. Big and you're for forgiven, <laughs> Chris. But Rob said, she's coming in. I'm looking for... Um, actors who can kind of sing, not singers who can kind of act. I'm looking for Emily Blunt is what I was looking for. No, 100%, 100%. Yes, it's true. But um, I was very scared to audition for you, but I'm so <laughs> grateful that I did. Well, it, I mean, for me, um, it was earth-changing. Because, you know, when you, when you have a, a, an actor that you love, and I loved your work, and I, we had met a few times. And yeah. So and, and loved each other right away, like old friends, <laughs> crazy. That's so weird. Yeah. But you have chemistry with everybody, so that's just how it goes. <laughs> but I just remember when you when you started to sing, it was Moments in the Woods, what you saw here. It was... In the wrong key. Oh, it did not sound <laughs> good. It was, sounded better then. It was, but it was all there. It was a full performance, and I couldn't believe it, and I started to cry. I started to cry because I couldn't... There was the movie, right there was the movie. You know, that's what I don't think people understand. You know, you, these, you take these little baby steps and you're tr looking for the film. And in walks the film. In walks the story. It's the story of the baker's wife, really. And it's your story. And there it was. And I, we had a movie. And I just thought, I'm going to work for th with this woman for the rest of my life. And I really felt that. And I still feel that. <laughs> you know that Rob was, uh, I think, the second person I told that I was pregnant? Um, my husband first. <laughs> I, I, I think John might have heard first. Um, but he, Rob had cast me in Into the Woods. I didn't realize I was pregnant when I auditioned for you. So I got the part, and then I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And I'm also supposed to be playing this childless woman. <laughs> like, baron, baron. <laughs> baron, poor baron woman. Um, so I waited till I was sort of nine weeks, ten weeks, just hoping everything would be okay with the baby. And I called Rob and I went, um, I need to tell you something. And he goes, you're having a baby. <laughs> and I went, uh, yes, 
I am. And he immediately went, it's not going to be a problem. You can hide behind James Corden <laughs> and every tree in the woods and the cow and there, anything else we can we have a lot put to in hide front behind. of you. There's a and lot I of had trees. an apron and it was fine. It was it great. Was you fine. don't see it at all. Yeah, well, towards the end <laughs> you do. But <laughs> but I remember doing that scene, uh, that, the scene that precedes that one mm, with, with Chris, Chris Pine. Pine. And we'd rehearsed it when I was like three months pregnant. And by the time we shot it, I was seven and a half months pregnant. And there's a bit where he does this like big dip with me. And I just was like, I hope you've been doing some squats because <laughs> there's like 20 more pounds coming <laughs> down on your quads right now. But um, you had such, you were amazing with him. Oh, I it loved was, Chris. He was Pine. so funny in that, and he you was were awesome. so great with him. That scene was just divine, and so just working funny. with it. And he was in awe of you, Em, as we all are. You know, he's like, he, I remember him saying, "How do you do this?" You know, because he tortures himself. Like, <laughs> how am I going to do this? And you were, and you just. You, you I remember his vocal warm ups in the room next to mine, and okay. I'd just be trying to take a pregnant nap. <laughs> I'd be like, "Shut up!" <laughs> <laughs> he would literally be like, "Ha ha ha!" Like all day. I Everybody was, was like, so oh. scared. So funny. And 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 your experience with Sondheim. Oh. I mean, how amazing to have had that experience. Very scary when he came to the recording studio. Mm -hmm. And that's, he, that's when he wanted to be there. He wanted to make yeah. sure, as we were putting it down, Yes. and we had worked on it a lot, but he, you know, he, he came and he really was, he, you know, he, he listens, he doesn't even look at you, right? He, yeah. he doesn't look, he, he's hearing it and, and feeling it. And, and sometimes he looks a bit tortured by it, you know, which is quite scary. I, I mean, I don't know if I ever told you that when I said that I was gonna cast you, um, he had, he, he had um, say over you and James and Meryl and his in his that was sort of like what he in you his did tell me I guess it's his, yes. did I tell you I, th in, I, I in, think in you his told like me whatever had, in his contract or so um, he said these words Hallelujah Thank mm. God mm. <laughs> Can you imagine if he went Ooh <laughs> 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 Okay now I'm just gonna jump to the Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> sure. Because I don't know about you guys, but when I saw that film, this is what I th thought to myself. Who <laughs> is that? <laughs> this is a brilliant, hilarious, great actor. I, I mean, I, I just thought it doesn't get better than that. It's so, I mean, it's just, to me, you take the movie and it, Put it in your pocket, because that's what it was for me, a hundred percent for me. And I, so, what was? How did that all come about? I mean, w w did you have to read? Or oh God, yeah. I mean, I wasn't. No one knew who I was or anything. And I, I was auditioning for a different thing at Fox. I remember I was going in to read for something else, and then I was really late for the airport. And so maybe I was just sort of frantic and chaotic, which might have worked for the <laughs> character and. Mm -hmm. They said, hey, would you ever read for this other thing we're doing? It's just this little thing with Meryl Streep. I was like, what? <laughs> um, so uh, I read one of the scenes. I think that one. So funny. I think it's it was so that funny. one. And, so and I was quite chaotic and then ran, almost missed my flight, and then got a call a week later from David Frankel. And he said, look, I would cast you but the studio was wondering if you could wear something more stylish. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding me. No, to be fair, I was wearing like a hoodie and jeans when I auditioned <laughs> for it. So I, I pulled together something that I thought looked fairly chic. I don't know. It probably was <laughs> awful. And I read for it again in London. And then he called me the next day and he said, I want you to do it. And I cried. Oh my God. I was in my mum's house and I walked out into the garden to take the call and I cried. Was it life changing, that film? Life changing. For you? Yeah. I mean, the, the experience was life-changing. It was heaven. That movie was heaven. We had a party. It was just, you can tell, it was just exquisitely fun. And it played to all your strengths, oh, too. God, I mean, that's what so I loved fun. about it. I, love, I just love that, you, you, you know, it's your vulnerability. That's what I love in all your work. Well, I think the thing with her, especially, is that on the page she came across as, you know, she was so acerbic and so cutting and I thought it might be funnier to play her desperate you know I think that desperation is funnier than someone but see who's th just but but then we got to really really see those comic chops that's what we got to see and then you go wait wait a minute is there no end to the range uh, the is there no end to the range for me 
<laughs> no, because, because, I mean, already you're doing that. So it, it, it's extraordinary. And you were nominated for a BAFTA and a Golden Globe for that as well, which was extraordinary work well, that it was will the live forever. the time of mm. my life. That it will live it forever. Was the, it was the best. It was the best. Um, can I just ask just quickly about Charlie Wilson's War? Because of I know course. it was a smaller role, but yeah. because it was Mike Nichols' last film. Yes. So I'm always curious, you know, because he's our God. All yeah. directors, are, he's our God. What was that like with him? You know, he was truly one of the first big champions of my career because I auditioned for him while I was still filming Devil Wears Prada. So no one had seen Devil Wears Prada. And it was kind of like when Prada came out, things changed quite a lot. But I auditioned for him right at the tail end of that shoot. And he still cast me. Really? Yeah. So it was really meaningful to me. And then I was... It was so surreal to be sort of crawling over all over Tom Hanks in my <laughs> underwear, and I'd like grown up watching him. It was so odd. Now, but <laughs> I mean, I love Tom Hanks, but it was so. Strange. I'm sure he was a gentleman. I'm sure he, he really was. was. Yeah, yeah. He was. But but is that intentional? Like, for instance, I mean, it's interesting when you c start carving a career. Now you're in a position where maybe you have a little choice. Yeah. Little choice, right? It starts. It's that that's what's so interesting. You know, you hit with something that's so big. And everybody goes, whoa. Yeah. You know, and I mean, we all did. Um, then there's, then do you start saying, well, okay, now this is something different. This is, like you were saying before, that this is, okay, now I get to mix it up a little. Yeah, this I feel sexy. there's like a, there's a pattern that sometimes happens. Mm. I think maybe you'll remember this, Chris, as well. Like after Prada, I think I got offered a lot of sort of bitchy British people. <laughs> and I was like, I can do other things, you know. <laughs> So I yeah, it was cool to play something sexy and uh, physical like that in Charlie Wilson's, and and it's always been a conscious decision to not get pigeonholed um, or or trapped in a lane. Mm. But that's but that takes a lot of guts because a lot of people are fearful about will they work and and to sort of say no, I'm gonna I trust myself, mm -hmm. and I see that in your work, you know. It's you, you, you see the trust in yourself. And, y you know, it, it, it's, it's always kind of staggering to me. Anyway, so I, I will say that was, that to me was exciting to see you in a sort of a whole different light. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That, and that, um, I, I, I just want to now sort of jump to s a, a movie that I adore. Um, and, it, and for many reasons, but it's The Young Victoria. And The Young Victoria is about. Young Victoria, <laughs> Queen <laughs> Victoria, and it's your movie. So that's a different thing on a different scale. And what's sort of incredible about that film for me is that you, you think of Victoria in a certain way, you know, corseted and kind of the queen, which is exactly opposite of how you played her. How did you approach that? Where did that come from, that idea? Jean-Marc Vallée, the great Jean-Marc oh, Vallée, who we lost, which is the saddest thing, he, he was incredible. Because he kept saying to me, um, he was French-Canadian, and he was like, she's a rock star. She's, she forget wow, the bonnet. Wow, what a great... Forget the bonnet, she's a rock star, <laughs> you know. And... A, and, and a rebel, and he would play Rolling Stones on set, and he would play, the atmosphere on set was so kinetic and so, um, such a juxtaposition from the corsets and the bonnets, and the, it was just, I think it was it, the vibe Were that that took us all over, and, and the realism of playing it. Um, it's almost like you have to, I feel with a period drama, otherwise it can feel really stuffy just to play against the costume. Was that freeing you know? for you to be able yeah, to do that? Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. And was I and and for you when you were when w you know, did you ever think, "Oh, I I have to sort of do the royal thing and and and, and you know, or or is, was it I'm just going to play this as a woman?" Yeah, I think he was just really open to um any thoughts I had and and I remember we were doing the coronation scene and the cra and the throne was pretty high up. And my feet were hanging off the edge. And I said, that would be a great shot. You know, just uh. to show how young she was. And I just remember that shot he did of the feet not touching the floor, you know. And 
It was all his openness and the nuance of depicting this little girl in a job where she is way over her head. And that's really the truth, is that she was thrust into a position as a child, effectively, as an 18-year-old, where she was just way over her head. See, that's what you do, Alma. You always go into the corners of these characters and find the vulnerabilities of them mm -hmm. so that they're full. And, and, and so that's when I watch your work. It's so astonishing because you see all of the sort of rough edges. Yeah. You know, that's what you do. And I think you look for, do you look for those rough edges? Search, search for them, want, want them. But I that's what I think makes them. you so human. And that's what I mean when I say we relate to you. You know what I mean? There are people that you see on film, you think, oh, well, that's it, but you don't relate to them. Right. We are with you, even as young Victoria. It was incredible. Thank you. And a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actress. So now you're in the, this other league, right? So that's exciting. Yeah. You were a baby. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I just think it's just when I think about that, it's just, it, it, it's, you know, it, it, you see it coming. You see how you were moving into these, I don't know, into, into stardom, into film stardom. And it's true. I know you don't think that, but we do. And we see you. It's because who do you want to watch? Who do you want to be with? Who, do you, who can take you through a journey and, and you can feel for them and care? I, I, you know, that's what I, when I watch you, I care about everything you do. I care about that person because you show me all of it. And that's what's so extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Am I right? It's <laughs> stunning. <laughs> it's stunning and it happens in every single thing you do. I'm telling you, it's the truth. It's the I easiest thing to drink. say. This is so much. <laughs> it's too many nights. This is your life. <laughs> this is it. Who's coming out? Uh, yeah, exactly. They go. Um, then, you know, I, now you're going to laugh about this because I just, I, just need to, I just need to mention the Adjustment Bureau for a second. Oh, Being stop <laughs> it. See? I'm telling you, Em. No, no it's it, such an in-joke with me and Matt Damon now, truly. It's like, cause we're, we're neighbors. I don't know if anyone knew that. We live in the same building. We will see each other around Brooklyn Heights, and he'll just pretend to just do that with a fedora <laughs> to me <laughs> from across the street. It's just it's the best. Right, and you danced it. And you, but, you know, <laughs> he, but he, uh, here's, here's what you had with him, and, and, and it's what we were talking about before, but you have with everybody, is chemistry. He's, you could have... I mean, Matt is like, you could have, he's just heaven to have chemistry with because he's just so easy and relaxed and wonderful. And we we really hit it off and and he's my friend. He's a I gem. know, but you feel it. You feel it. And it, it was, was kind of in a weird him. way, maybe a little bit of your entree into the action world. Do you know what I mean? It's that yes. kind of, yeah. that kind of movie. Yeah. You know, and that bigger kind of movie. That's yeah. sort of a bigger budget. Yeah, it movie. felt like a big movie. It felt yeah. like, and he's, yeah, uh, when I met Matt, I was like, yeah. he's the hot. But, there, but, but then now, all of a sudden, now you're doing those movies, that, that kind of movie, which is really exciting. And, mm -hmm. and it's loved, right? Everybody sees it. And, and it's just, well, because it's fun. It's fun and, and exciting and, and Matt thrilling. Matt and I did press for Oppenheimer recently, and this journalist came in and he went, oh, my God, I loved you guys in the Attachment Bureau. <laughs> 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 It's my favorite when they get the names wrong. It's the best. <laughs> I did press with Benicio for Sicario. And I did this movie called The Wolfman with Benicio. Mm. You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> um, for The Wolfman. Um, but a journalist came in and she went, oh, my God, I loved you in The Wild Man. <laughs> <laughs> Do you correct them or no? Which is, what's that? Do you correct them? No, I I just laughed so hard. Because it also it's the perfect sort of name for Benicio Del Toro. It's just called The Wild Man. It's just, oh, just heaven. It was just heaven for me. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, so in a way, I kind of feel like at a certain point in, in this part of your career, you started to really sort of dig into some comedy work, which is just, isn't that joyous to be on a joyous. set like that? Like with Ewan McGregor oh. and salmon fishing in the Yemen. So yeah. is that, I mean, for me, like, it's it's so fun. It just feels, it, it just, it, it fits you. It suits you. It's It must have felt kind of fantastic. To I, you, I love doing comedy, and I but I love doing comedy with the right, again, the right people, the right environment, the right director, the ability to throw the kitchen sink at it and see what might be funny and where you can be uninhibited. I think comedy needs a lack of inhibition on set. I think I think you need to feel really trusting and confident mm -hmm. and 
a willingness to improv and stretch something around and do you like that do you like being thrown into something yeah. You can Im- yeah what about rehearsals how do you feel about rehearsals don't don't love them unless it's for a musical mm-hmm. well you have to yeah you have no choice because it's you <laughs> <laughs> again <laughs> again yeah i like it um i think what i loved working with you is that and it's the only reason it's probably the only you're the only person who can make movie musicals in the most extraordinary way is that you have figured out that this the songs are extensions of the scenes and it's just that idea that if someone can't quite express themselves in a scene then they'll sing it and there's a seamlessness from scene to song and the reason you rehearse I realize with such a kind of meticulous, beautiful approach is so that you feel that seamlessness, like as people mm-hmm. transition into songs, so that you don't have that eggy moment of people being like, and here's a song, you know, and every, the whole audience sort of tightens with cringe, you know, and um, <laughs> which can happen with, especially happen. with movie musicals, because you can. the face is the landscape suddenly, and you see, you register everything so much more closely, but and you don't have that. Yes. P- the performative nature of a stage. So yes, and it, I I loved it, especially on on Poppins. That you know, um, that it, there was so, so much preparation and so much freedom. Therefore, on the day, mm. you know. Well, I have to say, it, it, you know, you need a great actor to be able to make that transition, so that the, so that the so that the song continues the scene. Mm-hmm. And we sh- and we shouldn't be aware that you're singing. And I and never Rob does this inc- I- amazing thing that's also like terrifying for actors, where we will rehearse, which is heaven. You pre-record the songs, knowing what the scene will look like because you've rehearsed it for weeks, which is so helpful because then the song fits into the movie. You pre-record, and then on the day, you sing to your track. And then he has this terrifying moment where he goes, "Okay, we're going to do one live." And everyone's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's <laughs> terrifying. And so, th- and and then you're given a little in-ear earwig where you can hear the score, but no one else on <laughs> set can. It's true. So it's a terrible a cappella <laughs> version of <laughs> that. And oh, it's horrific. Yes, it's but so can I just say right now, I it, w- like I my hands sweat even talking about I it. I would say. I would say mm, 75 to 80% of that song was live. But that's a talky, singy song. Maybe yeah, but that's think. harder. I think in a way that's harder. Mm-mm. Well, because you're not just sort of la- launching into... <laughs> Excuse us for a minute. No, I'm not, I'm not having to like Mariah Carey my way through a song. No, but I'm so saying like, that you're... Uh, it's I'm, more like kind of thought processes. So yes, like, but, yeah. but that kind of thing is so, in some ways, harder because you are literally having to play the scene to a rhythm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Do you know that was the day I remember Stephen Sondheim was um, in the recording studio and he loved It Takes Two, which was the thing, the se- the song I do with James Corden. And I remember he came in when I was singing Moments in the Woods and gave me a note. What was it? What was the note? He came in and he goes, just, just like, stop staying on the beat. Just throw it away. Tell me a story. Tell me a story. Mm, see? That's and what like, he cares wasn't about. interested in it being musical or perfect or contorted to, I don't know, it's just, it was amazing. Because what he tries, he he in, embodies himself with I- each character, so th- he writes for that character. Yeah. And every little pause, every little rest has a reason, mm. you know, or how it moves through something, because he feels like that's how the person would speak and talk. Yeah, but he's interested in the thought process rather yes, than yes. how musical it is. Absolutely. It was so cool. Which is why some of the great performers of his musicals Aren't singer singers? Yes. Glynis Johns and yes, light music. Yes, Do you know what I mean? Yes. There, th- she sings "Send in the Clowns," but it's heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, great role for you. <laughs> great role for you. Yeah. Um, another fun five-year engagement. So much fun. So funny with Jason Siegel. Oh my God. I you guys love all the <laughs> weird ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because we get, oh, you know, because well, I mean, in this day and age, that's yeah. what you want to watch. You want to see that and, and <laughs> lift it and laugh, and it's fun. And, well, and fun. It, it, I mean, that's I mean, it must have been fun to sort of say, okay, s- some comedy work that you get to sort of really 
dig into that for yourself. I mean, I I I love it. I mean, it's it's endlessly fun, and especially I mean that was my also my first experience working with those guys who they they are writing on the day it is. Nick Stoller, Jason, ever they they'd be yelling out lines from behind the camera to try, really? you know, and it was just so spontaneous and bonkers. And you're okay with that kind of that? Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's great. It's great. So it's that. I mean, uh, some people would I like, freeze up and would freak. But out I like and adapting, and you 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 have to adapt. You have to embrace um, different experiences, and. I think sometimes the best movies, and certainly where you have the best chemistry with someone, um, usually is born from a certain chaos, for, for me, in my mm. experience on set, where there's rewriting happening, there's stuff is spontaneous and alive, and energy sort of bouncing off the walls, and you feel like you're in, um, you, you're trying to get out of a safe room or something. It's like every day is like trying to, it's like that, <laughs> <laughs> you know that those people do those uh, um, escape rooms. You do escape rooms, and that's what sometimes the day can feel like. But at the end of the day, you've ended up with a scene that's that's kinetic. It's it's crackling with something rare and real, and and the, especially with comedy, mm. I think that's yeah, a because great it way happens to in work. the moment. Doesn't yeah, it? yeah, it's great to work like. I that. know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. <laughs> I want them to do you watch yourself on the monitor uh, do you no watch tapes? never 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 I don't like never doing that. never because never. I think you um I mean maybe for like a, a stunt you know yeah to make sure it's you're doing it right yeah yeah to make sure you're not running weird yeah you know, <laughs> <laughs> by the way <laughs> I mean this was some advice that Matt Damon gave me that when he did the born identity he was working with that amazing actress who just done run Lola run oh wow yeah and she watched him do a run, and she goes, um, you should watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, what do you mean? And, and she goes, just how you think you run is not how you run. <laughs> and it's true. It's true? It's true. Oh like, you'll have a wonky leg, or you'll kind of be hunched, or it'll just, it won't look great. That's so funny. So I, I watch myself run, <laughs> and I'll watch myself do a but stunt. But I've never seen you say, can I see that take back? Can oh, I, I see that? Uh, no, no, no. And, and I think it's because I spend the experience of the film looking out. Mm. And when you see it reflected back at you, it comes back at you like that. And I don't like that energy. And it makes you self-conscious then? In well, a I way? just said they're probably a bit of waste of time. It's sort of like, yeah, you're uh, a bit self-conscious. So there's, uh, there's a trust. I mean, that takes a lot of... Because you have different experiences with different directors and stuff, so the yeah. trust thing m is sometimes not easy. I would think not not always easy. Not like always there's easy. sometimes where I, you know, there's some movies you can't wait to see the back of, and there's some movies that you weep when they're done. And it's and over, yeah. You know, but there's only a few I've had that uh, I've had a tough time. Whether it's an ego or an agenda or, s or an environment that feels kind of toxic, and and that's not fun. Mm, that's you know? not fun. It's not, uh, life's too short. Yeah. Do you watch your films? I do. Do you watch them? I'll try to watch them twice. Okay, when would that w be? Films that I haven't enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> like a couple of them that I haven't enjoyed, I haven't ever seen. Really? Yet, yeah. what? I can't! Oh my God, that's a horrible I question. I can't and I won't. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, I will watch them twice because the first time I'll probably fixate on stuff and the second time I'll be more removed and that's a better but I th place. But I see you, you're such a generous person. I mean, maybe one of the most generous people I've ever met in my life. And so w I, I see you see the whole film even when you're watching, you watch the whole film. I try to. This, which is, extra I mean, I, c I don't even know how, you know, how you do that. I mean, uh, as an actor, how you could even watch a film. And well, I don't know if I used to watch films like that. I think it's like the longer you do it and the more interest I have in the entire all-consuming world of it. And I am really interested in how it's being shot now and what the emotional drive of the film is. What's the through line? What's the message? What do you want people to feel? And all of it now, like the pre-production, the editing, I'm really interested in all of it. Um, and then you're gonna direct. No. <laughs> I've seen what you guys go through. 
I'm married to one. Okay, that's true. I know. Mm, that's true. <laughs> maybe, maybe at some point. Yeah, I can maybe see that. Maybe some point. It'd be very, I, it's natural for you, I think. Um, so what's interesting is with these sort of next two films, in a way, it's a totally different it's a left turn to Which a ones? different genre. So Looper, yeah, and then The Edge of Tomorrow. Oh, like yeah. Like those two. So now we're in full sci-fi. <laughs> I mean, that's what I mean by range. I mean, I don't know anybody who can do that. I mean, seriously, I, I no one. Well, I didn't think I could do it. I mean, I'd barely worked out before Edge of Tomorrow, <laughs> and you know, it was one of those things where they're like, you know, you're going to do an action movie, and I was twenty. 28 and I was like oh it won't take me long to get into shape and then you're like oh god like it takes months what did you do I did six days a week two workouts a day what for three months and I did everything from you know weight training to Krav Maga gymnastics I ran the UCLA track those steps <laughs> in a weighted vest no. Shoot me. Did your body? <laughs> oh, it's hell. I mean, I remember that the first two weeks I was in <laughs> so much pain. My body was just killing me. And I remember even Ew. brushing my teeth at night like that. I couldn't, <laughs> like, Thank you so much. I couldn't move my arm. I couldn't. I would get out of bed and just like stagger to the bathroom. I mean, I was just I, I was in so much pain all the time. My muscles had never worked like that. And then all of a sudden your body does change and it transforms and your ability became, uh, my capacity physically became so addictive. And then, you it know, you work with Tom Cruise, you really, he'll tighten the screws on everyone when it comes to like <laughs> what you think you're capable of. And because he can do everything and wants to do everything, it makes you want to meet him where he's at. Wow, that's know? beautiful. Did he inspire you to completely, do that? Completely, completely. He's he was so inspiring, such a doll to me. He's so and so gracious. Cute. Oh, he's so cute. I loved him. <laughs> and he's um, yeah, he was amazing. And and maybe it was my first experience also where I was brought so much into the fold. And that was another movie that at times was chaotic. Like we were sort of writing the third act as we went and. Again, it's sometimes the best movies. They're born out of that. that because it's all happening in the focus. It's like yes. fixing something. Everybody's focused on fixing it, and that becomes yeah. the best part. Yeah, and I think I thought it was going to be sort of boys' club, and he brought me into every script meeting, every every single decision. Well, because decision. you're so brilliant. I would have he you in a so script meeting, so too. Cool. But, I mean, th that was exciting for us to see you do that, do a kick-ass part. It there was you really were. fun. I mean, and... The full and metal bitch. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Such the coolest name ever. But I remember the first time they put those suits on us. Um, my suit weighed 85 pounds. Oh, my God. It was so heavy that I started to cry in front of Tom Cruise. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> like, they put it on. He's, like, looking at me. And I was like, no, it's just, like, I wasn't, like, really expecting it to be, like, so heavy. And I was, like, panicking about seven months of it. And then you just... <laughs> get on with it. And it was it was great. And so you surprise yourself ultimately. Yeah, it was the hardest thing physically I will ever, ever do in my life was that movie. Wow. I mean the suits were so heavy that I would walk from here to there and you'd be out of breath. Oh my God. And then in between mm. takes they were such a palaver to take off that they would they had these like A frames on set with hooks and they'd like hang your suit and you just hang in it like a puppet <laughs> and so i just like there's pictures of me and tom just like talking <laughs> hanging in our suits you know because you just they, they take half an hour to take them off so into the woods yes and um just to jump on that for one more second because it was fun to talk um you know what was um i mean what was exciting about that was you know a, the whole song of it of course but also the fact that here you are doing a full musical Mm -hmm. And it felt so natural for you. To me, it did. And 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 once you were in it and doing what, you, did did it feel natural to you? Because of you. No, 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 no. No, no. It's time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's because of you. It's because you were so emboldening, interested, free, excited by actors, weren't interested in perfection didn't really care how it sounded. It was just, it was just an ex the most, um, 
buzzy experience for me working with you mm. and it was a match really, made in heaven really magical I'm and we were such a uh, we were really were a kind of company of actors on that you know i mean we did rehearse and you know and it was so wonderful to have you with Meryl again because oh. we saw you in a different way. I mean, you've had that experience with her many times now, and a few yeah. with me, and, and two with you. Yeah, I know. And she just she she's in awe of you. I mean, she said this to me last night as oh. well. She's <laughs> she's in awe of you and what you do, and how you do it, and who you are. That's what I just need to say for just a minute, <laughs> because. You have to understand that Emily, it <laughs> I just have to say this because it's- This is your last nice thing you're allowed to say. No, see- That's it. Uh, it's all the British coming out in her. She hates it so much. But yep. th the thing is, I, it's just that, you know, you are such a, as you can see, this is who Emily is. There's no, there's no, <laughs> there, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing hidden here. It's like, this is who you are. You are, you are, you're such a, a true friend, a real person who, who is loved by everybody and especially by women. I mean, em all of Emily's friends are like major actors who adore you, and, you, and they all center around you. It's like a, you're like a satellite, and they're all, they all come to you because of who you are, and that's that generosity of spirit. But you see, I mean, th and it's a very special, unique thing and that happens, and it doesn't happen, because I've worked with so many women in, in, in the business, and you just, there's something about you that is, everyone's attracted to who you are, the truth of who you are, the reality of who you are, and all of that plays into what you bring to the screen. I really, truly believe that. That's why I feel like you, in a way, have see-through skin. You can feel what you're feeling. When, when I watch you, I feel it and feel so connected every time. That's it. I'm going to cut you off now. That's, <laughs> it. That's enough. That's enough. That's your last nice thing. Well, you got a Golden Globe <laughs> nomination for, for that, and that was exciting, and I was so thrilled. Yes, it was so happy. Um, and, then, and then a complete sort of change to something that was so brutal and so rough and so hard was Sicario. Oh, Sicario. Sicario. Oh, I love Sicario. I mean, for me, that was, I mean, I just remember watching with John and we were just yeah. astonished by your work in that. The it, movie is so astonishing. It's so hard to watch. Yeah, it's, it's so astonished. brutal. And once again, we're seeing it through your eyes. Like you're, we're you. You know, you're you, you're part of this. And I think, she, I mean, she was such an amazing role because she, um, she's in such an incoherent world and she has to be as lost and as in the dark as the audience. But you were, then you made that happen for us. So oh, we're, so so we're following it all through you. And I think I didn't realize when we were shooting it just how much was from her perspective. I didn't realize maybe that there was nothing um, portraited about it. It was mm. very much like an interior yes. um, journey for the audience, you know, through her eyes and it was all through as her she's eyes. thrust into yes. this amoral world and she's a character who's all about morality and the FBI, they ha they're held accountable for every bullet that's fired and she's suddenly in a world where bullets are sprayed and it's just yeah. so wild. And um, friends of mine who know that world well have all said, oh my God, that's the most well-observed version of that world we've seen and who's leaked stuff because that's really how it goes. That's really how it like goes. Like Josh's character, the CIA guy in the flip-flops, that's based on someone. You wow. Know, that's like guys I know who have worked with the CIA, they're like, that guy is, that's right. But it was it was brutally honest is what it felt like. To I know, and those boys just, oh, Josh and Benicio are just the best. Because the ha best be guys. Because, because, so you go through something brutal like that, like that scene where there's a gun yeah. in your throat. And then they say, cut. Mm -hmm. So what happens then? I mean, after a scene like that, you know, it was quite an intense one. And there was a big, uh, I remember that, uh, but I mean, normally I don't take the work home with me. And we would ha have levity on set. I've known Benicio a long time and Josh is, you know, heaven. And But I remember after, there's a big fight scene with John Bernthal in it. I don't know if you guys remember, if you've seen that scene. Mm where we have this very physical, very ugly, very violent fight. And we didn't over choreograph it and we really kind of kicked the shit out of each other. It was terrible. Oh and God. Um, I mean, John Bernthal's wonderful. And he said like, I used to be a boxer. My face is pudding. You can just hit me. I won't feel it. And it's kind of true. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and I did hit him. Um, but we finished that scene and I felt fine. and. 
we all went and got fajitas at craft service <laughs> and we were like, great scene, high five. You know. <laughs> and then I went home and I went to bed and my heart was like, oh wow. Like couldn't mm. shut off that feeling of panic and what it is to be completely overpowered by a guy. Ooh. I was like, I couldn't sleep for a week. It's a horrible. It was just a horrible feeling. And I don't feeling. think people understand that, you know, w you have to live through it. I even, think something you know, even is though you're violent acting in as a yeah. camera, you're living th there's something you are you are living it. Yeah, you you're you in know? a different part of your brain mm -hmm. when you do stuff like that. So maybe it collects there. later and I then the emotion so. came out or something. I you think know? so. And there's certain scenes that will really wipe me out, you know, and I'll be tired after them. Yeah. But I do try not to, st I, I can't work in a tortured way. I don't want to torture myself. I don't want to torture those around me. And I don't want to go home to my children in a weird state. But there are scenes that are lasting, that their fingerprints can be intense. And mm. some of the Sicario scenes had, had those. I'm sure. And I, and, and I would think the girl on the train. Yeah. Which is. Heavy. Heavy. Also. I was pregnant with my second kid on that. Wow. Train. I know. Kind of <laughs> raging alcoholic. Well, I mean, it's amazing. You know, you're having this career. You're having this amazing career. And you're done. At the same time, you're also this um, extraordinary mother. And you're balancing that. How do you. Uh, what, like. I mean, I, I know because I see it in action. It, it's. It, it's. An He's like the uncle to my children. He and John <laughs> come to us for 4th of July every year and my children call them their funkles because <laughs> they come with like sacks of candy and <laughs> gifts and they, and I told the girls I was seeing you oh, tonight and the they wondered what you were gonna bring me because you just always come <laughs> laden with like it's amazing coming. gifts. But um, yeah, they, they adore you guys. Well, the, the balance that you create is, is, is something extraordinary to watch too because that's, that's a full-time job and you're a full-time yeah. mother in a most amazing, beautiful way. Thank you. But something like, you know, when you get to something like Girl on the Train where you're playing someone who's basically unlikable yeah. in a way. Do you know what I mean? And a sort of unreliable n narrator as well. Yeah, so, so, and we're seeing it all through her perspective. How do you find your way into someone like that who's so mm. diametrically opposed from who you are? It's just, you, it's, it's, she's so damaged. And so how are you, f you know, how do you find your way into that person? I mean, um, have you guys ever seen that show, Intervention? I watched a lot of Intervention to play her because that show, um, it's real people with a real addiction, with real trauma, mm. with that quiet desperation of addiction that you watch and the damage that, um, and the ripple effects around them. And it's a traumatic show to watch, but it's such a window into the reality of it because um, you don't want to be doing the undignified thing of just misrepresenting it or misidentifying what mm. it is to be in the position that the character was in. Mm. So I usually go to a documentary or something like that to really see what that's about. And so that was enormously helpful. And the, the, the tricky balance with Girl on the Train and yet the thing I enjoyed about it is that because it's a murder mystery, you're kind of playing two things. You're playing the reality of the character right but you're also trying to pull the wool over the audience's eyes right. at the same time. So it's sort of a fun challenge, you know, to be this unreliable narrator, but also be very truthful and try and honor what this person's going through, you know? It's, it, 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 it's, it's a masterful performance. And I, you were nominated for a SAG and a BAFTA for that for Best Actress, and it was, it was astonishing to watch. Thank and, you. And, and, and once again, surprising. And, and, and no vanity. No, which not for that one. <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, I remember the um, they had these contact lenses that they made me for the really, really drunk scenes. And it was a full contact lens that covered the entirety of your uh, eyes so that your whites of your eyes would be red. Mm. That's, that's my lasting memory of going. <laughs> <on the show. laughs> it was just like that all day. Um, a Quiet Place. Yes. Mm. A quiet place. Can we just talk about that scene we just all watched? That scene we just watched. And 
behind the camera <laughs> is your husband. <laughs> yeah. And you're having this child without being able to make a sound. I just Which is how I did it in real life <laughs> as well. So that's why John wrote the scene. Because it's like, she can do that. I mean, I just remember I was at the premiere. And yes. We were sitting in your were. row with all your oh. great friends. And we literally were all holding hands. Yeah. At that moment. I remember. Because it was so hard to watch. And you played it so brutally, honestly, as we see. And it's just, I mean, how do you go there, Em? It is just... It, do they say, okay, now take two? I mean, what happens? No, we shot it over the course of five days. It was a five-day birth. Jeez. You know, we started in the bedroom where the water breaks and then gradually moved down to the basement. And, and you're holding on to that for f literally five days? That yeah, it was. I think I had to be like institutionalized at the end of that. Oh, it was, God. Did he I ask think John and I always laugh that like we managed to get through Quiet Place um, on a lot of whiskey. Whiskey <laughs> and car rides listening to music together, you know, and that was great, but... It was just, it, it was such a, an, um, I loved the chewy challenge of it. It was so, yes, exhausting, yeah, but it was so exhilarating. And um, I just adored how John shot it. And like, that's the other thing when you work with your, I mean, you've worked with John for years yes. and with your John. And there's a comfort. In t there's I mean, a comfort there's with a, you guys, yes. but we'd never done it before. That's true. So it's kind of scary because mm. you're sort of a different person when you're at work. Yes. And there was that moment before we started filming where I was like, do you know how to shoot this movie? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I was like, do you know what a lens is? Because I, I don't. So I'm just like hoping. And, and I just remember being so wowed by him on the oh, first so day beautiful. and I, it was just like this unrecognizable other superpower that I hadn't seen it was extraordinary and so I knew he was going to shoot it in such an emotional visceral raw way and he was so inspired by Spielberg and Nolan and all of these incredible visionary guys and he shot it in six weeks uh, for $17 million, we made that movie, and it was just, n none of us knew it would become what it did, but um, yeah, the birth scene was, it was wild. It was wild. stunning, and it's, and, and it's I, I think, you know, it <laughs> I mean, you won a SAG award for that. It was so surprising. Not me, not to me. Well, mm. I was shocked. Not to me. I mean, <laughs> I mean, It was I sort was of like, shocked. well, because you're loved, and people know, and people know. That you're in your own league. We know. Everybody in this room knows. <laughs> that's for sure. This room knows. Absolutely knows. Um, there was a little movie you did called Mary Poppins Returns. Tiny little movie. <laughs> um, let me just say, I'll just say this sort of very, excuse the pun, bluntly. Do it. <laughs> um, if it's something nice, keep it short. It, it's, it's quick. Okay. There was no movie without you. Oh, man. There was no movie. Who's going to play this role? Who can play this role? I mean, it's like James Bond, you know, like there's like one or two or three, you know, it's like, who's gonna play Mary Poppins? Who can play that? All the colors. She's such a rude person, <laughs> Mary Poppins. I love that about her. She's so funny. She does, so does she just suffers no fools. And she's, she's just, she, and it's, she's just way ahead of everybody. And she's just, and, and, but also so caring and loving underneath. And that, you know, you need a great actor to play that. People think Mary Poppins, they don't understand. This is a great role. And you knew that. You knew that. You knew it was a I great was role. I so scared. <laughs> it was so scary. And I'm sure scary for you in many ways. I mean, I don't know if you maybe name it as that, because I think you're so, you're so powerful in your tenacity of just creating that I think maybe any fear just becomes white noise to you or something. And and I think you take everyone else's fear away because of your conviction. And that's so exciting to be around. And I remember you and I talking a great deal about her and how to carve out new space for ourselves because the role is so iconic. It was played by somebody so iconic. So it was, you never though made it feel to me like I had this iconic boulder. I had to kind of like move out of the way. It was, it was not that way, it was just, what else mm. can we do? Mm. And we both read the books a lot. Yeah. And in the books, she's horrible. Horrible. 
to those kids. I mean, she's unspeakably rude <laughs> and she's not very warm and fuzzy at all. No. And she's weird. Yeah, she's eccentric she's and like odd. She's like really batty and sort of like <laughs> odd and We loved it so and you eccentric. loved that. And I was like, let's go there. Like, let's and do that. And you did. And, and you did, um, you know, even in the costumes, I remember Sandy, um, the great Sandy Powell, she'd, the coat would be blue, but the inside was this polka dot bright orange. And it was just such, so emblematic of mm -hmm. the character, like held together with, um, you know, this very precise poise. And then underneath is this madness that she just wants to unleash. And do you remember we decided that in the musical numbers or in the adventures? Yes it was her sense of relish yes. that she couldn't fucking wait to do them. That's like right. it was so thrilling for her. Because she's a child, she lets that child yeah, out. Yeah, so could, exciting and then she and, and so to play all those colors, and it was extraordinary. Oh, I loved her so much. And your SAG nomination, your Golden Globe nomination for that was just beyond. And, and, I, and, and I just have to say that the scene that you saw where, you, where, where she comes in to the... Banks house for the first time. Um, that was the first scene we rehearsed. And um, and I remember sitting there. I mean, we had talked about it, but we hadn't put it on its feet. We hadn't really done it. Mm -hmm. And um, and we had great actors there, Ben Wishaw and Emily Mortimer, and f this wonderful children. They were just, so they're so spectacular. And, and we said, well, let's, 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 let's try this. And, I'm, and I thought, oh, this is, you know, Emily's going to walk in as Mary Poppins. And you can't, You walked through the door, our fake little door that we had there on, on the sound stage where we were rehearsing, and there she was. Like, instantly there. There was Mary Poppins. It was, I mean, it was, I, I cried again. I, I cried I again because so I couldn't, scared. well, I couldn't believe that you had found it immediately. It was not, just not to me. I mean, I was like, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, was, I, I was scared. And uh, like Rob approached me um, again. I always seem to associate pregnancy with Rob now. But <laughs> um, Rob had said to me, I really want you to be Mary Poppins. And I was so honored and so floored. And I said, I just want you to know, John and I really want to have another baby. And we were sort of planning to have one soon. And he said, OK, I'll push a few months. You we know. did. And so we pushed. And um, and so I remember, and I always do this on every movie, really, but especially on something like Poppins, where it's such a, dis I wanted to play someone very distinctive. I will usually rent a, a house if I don't have any alone time at home with the kids or with John there. I'll rent somewhere for like a few days and I'll just walk around like a crazy person talking to myself until something lands and what I don't know how it materializes but something will just I'll find an inn and I remember waddling around nine months pregnant <laughs> trying to find <laughs> how to play her you know and feeling so and I remember being at the first table read and it was the first time I did the voice for you and I was and really scared it was so exciting to I hear I was so scared well, and we had been talking about Rosalind Russell we've been watching yes. his girl yes, Friday it's so fast it's, it's so, so quick fast. And she's and so like smart the way she speaks with that velocity like that she should come in like a tornado and just sweep everything up and make everything right again. And and, and, it, I and, was and once again, I, I see that and I say, well, there's the movie. That's what I see. And I said, you know, and it's an extraordinary performance. And, 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 it, and it, it, is, it, is, it is your performance. Do you know what I mean? It's all yours. It is sensational in, in addition to everything else and all the singing and all the dancing and all the musicality of that plus that. No one else can do that. It was such a joy bomb, the whole thing. It was just a th thrilling. Um, I, we're going to jump to Oppenheimer okay. again for a moment. And, and I, we're going to look at a clip from this um, extraordinary film, uh, epic film. Um, but to me, it all comes to a point after this extraordinary <laughs> journey to this moment. And um, let's take a look at this moment. I hope they're okay. <laughs> All right. This is, uh, this is a good one. This is a smart one. What's a, uh, what's a common technique you use to get emotionally ready for a scene? Uh, if it's a big, heavy scene, uh, 
uh, music always. I'll I'll listen to music. I'll have. Uh, depending on the film, there'll usually be like an album that will represent the film. Like I remember listening to like a lot of Radiohead on Sicario. Like <laughs> good, but yes, <laughs> yes. But there'll be like anthem songs. There will be a song I'm in love with that I will listen to on a loop a um, as I'm walking to set, and then by the time I get to set, I feel I'm in a good zone. You know? Because one of the hardest things, w as we know, is the waiting. Yeah. The waiting and then yeah. you're and then it's like wait but go. So I just tried to stay really zen, like really calm and um yeah, but y usually music. So you're Olympian, that's what I mean. Um so now that you've done a limited series and I thank you for bringing this up, The English, which was so thrilling. Talk thank about you. a whole nother genre. Thank you. A western. I mean, you're riding horses and you're killing people and Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was the most beautiful experience that series. I loved it, and it's so an astonishing deeply. performance. I loved and it, it, and surprising, and you ho you're holding a secret the entire time for a limited series. So I'm sorry, I'm asking another question, but <laughs> <laughs> um, is is television? And this is a great question, a limited series kind of thing. Is that something else you'd like to explore again in the future? Yeah, and why? I mean, well, I'd I'd been wanting to do long form storytelling for so long because it's it's that exquisite um lengthy journey you can go on with someone where you're gradually peeling back all the all the layers especially where there's a secret and a mystery um i'd never had that experience and the necessary stamina you need to sort of get through it and a full exploration of someone in their world that doesn't feel that you're contorting it to an hour and a half, two hours in a certain window, you know. So, I mean, when the English came along, I remember I read the first page and fell completely in love. It's just so, so beautiful, the most poetic rare, poetic, beautiful writing. That relationship is so stunning. And yeah, it was so, so wonderful. And a whole other genre. Damn, you're and I'd never really done a Western, you know, I'd always wanted to. That's what I mean. The yeah. range is off the charts. Um, Okay, if you could be friends with any of your previous characters you've played, who would be your, who and why? Mm. You know, I would like to be friends with the character in the English. She is the first one that comes to mind because she, I, uh, I've never admired a character so much. I just admired her so much. I thought she was the best of every woman. She was just had gone through so much grief and so much trauma still chose to walk into every day with this sense of hope and mm. kindness and empathy even though she'd been shown none of that and had been so stripped of her identity i just loved her probably her does mm. it make it in, in a way it inspires you to become a better person i guess if they live yeah. inside you in yes they yeah. kind of dwell in you and yeah you, it's beautiful you don't forget them you no know? well we don't forget your performance in that that's for sure and it's true. I mean, it's. I mean, it's beyond. She's gonna. So kill your me. question the will be followed by a very <laughs> wonderful compliment every she, time. She, she's, <laughs> she's literally when we go through that no, door, she's gonna, gonna go kill to me. The bar and I'm gonna slap you. Gonna, yeah, it'll be a full-on slap. Um, okay. Do you have a preference of shooting the tough, emotional scenes early in production Ooh. or later when you've developed your character? Later. And why is that? Just because they've lived in you. You you haven't got that sort of first day, first week jittery thing where I feel like I'm slightly behind myself day one. Like I have this feeling that I'm not quite inside of myself, you know. And um, I think any time you've got the full weight of the experience and the trust of the actors and the director, like that's the time where you can kind of tear it up a bit in a mm. big scene, you know. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. How do you how do you best manage wearing multiple hats? Because in, in terms of like for instance producing and oh. acting, I feel like on the English, which is really my main experience producing something, is that I felt that it's in the pre-production. I felt like I was in the producerial mode, and then once I started filming, I didn't really feel that way. I felt like I had to fully commit to the acting side of things. I don't know. It's, it's partly because, you know, Hugo Blick was at the helm of it and we had other great producers there, so I didn't have to kind of bear the weight of it, you know. And 
and when you're, I mean, and then in post, and so you're there in post. Yeah. Are you objective about the work? Yes. I yes, bet. I think I, I am are. actually, I and I think maybe it's just come from being around the block as long as I have been. Here I am, career <laughs> retrospective. I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> Oh my God! But there's so I much <laughs> more coming. <laughs> but I think um, I think I I'm so interested in all the facets of it and every nuance of it, and so I think I can be objective afterwards. Yeah, I, I, I it's sort of I disassociate from myself, maybe. That's why I think you have that skill big time. Um, what specific things do you look for when looking for a project? What are you mm. looking for? I'm looking for great writing, a whole world. It's not just about the character or the circumstance. I want to see someone with a really specific vision that maybe transcends your understanding of the world as you thought you knew it, that you want to feel that kind of, I feel like, awe is like an elusive emotion. I wish we could feel it more. Because I think it really, when you read that script and you're left rather awestruck by it, for whatever reason, it could be a mad comedy or it could be the English or Mary Poppins. It could be, it could be any. But I want to feel that um, life force mm. crackling through me where I don't really know like why I love it, and I can't name what it is about it. And sometimes you'll be given a script that, um, you know, I talk about this with Chris all the time, like it's like the script won't be there, but it's the promise of it. Mm. And I can't let go of that, The what I see it could be, right. even if it's not there fully, it's the promise of the world to come, you know? So you go with your gut. Is that yeah, and I, I want a character with conflict. I want them to be hard to read, hard to name. I want people in circumstances where they ha they're in over their heads, they are, mm. they're confused, they're, I, I think I look for, I look for conflict, you know? So beautiful, Anne. Um, so this is good. This is like a full on, like you better lie down for this one because oh God. <laughs> how do you deal with your inner critic? Good question. Ooh. Um, I just ha have Rob Marshall around me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, and the critic just sort of wafts away, <laughs> just disappears. Um, I, the critic will rear its head sometimes, of course. I feel I don't listen to that critical voice other than fleetingly. I hope I can self-correct if I do a doozy of a take, which I do. And you, you can feel when it's not working and I always try and have faith I'll get there. Um, I accept that I'm going to throw a lot at the wall to see what sticks. It's how I really like to work. And sometimes it could be the full spectrum of good or crap, but I, I appreciate the, the journey. I try, I, I, I listen to that voice, but only to try to make it better, maybe. Mm. So beautiful, Anne. Um, if you could portray any uh, historical figure, you know, I guess it's either dead or alive. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I'm just going to add that. Um, who would that be? Is there someone that that you? Is there a uh, historical character or or a person? I mean, I certainly. Well, I mean, I, I mean, a, 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 any woman of strength. I mean, to me, you know that, that because, I mean, I think you'd. Uh, well. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I just think, listen, any any woman uh, uh, historical, I mean, you know, when you see young Victoria and you see that, you see the beginnings of her career and you see, who, you know, how she has mm -hmm. to handle that, you know. Well, I think maybe that's of interest, like playing someone, a woman at a time, like we talked about, where women were being pretzeled, contorted to 
be something that they weren't where the odds were stacked against them. Like because those trailblazing women yes, in history, that yeah, would be cool. Exactly right. Yeah. Because then it's not all easy for them. It's not and then you have the, the what you were discussing. Then you have the conflict, yeah. yeah the conflict. Then you have the fight. Yeah. Beautiful. Um what advice do you have for female actors? And coming up in Hollywood, I just have to say the thing that made me laugh. You know this. I've told you this makes me laugh. I just uh, that Betty Davis was asked that question. What did she say? And she said, "This is what she said: Take Fountain." <laughs> <laughs> that was her it's advice true. for female actors: Take Fountain. Take Fountain. <laughs> so true. <laughs> it's so true. Never sunset, guys. Um, <laughs> Never take uh, Fountain. So advice. I mean, it's it's a broad question, but is there? I mean. It, I'm not going to say anything as witty as Betty Davis. I think. <laughs> um, you know what? It's a just go right through it. It's a. It can be hard. It's not easy. You got to wear a helmet sometimes. It's not always for the faint of heart. But put your feet to the fire and go through it. And if you have passion and if you have conviction and don't. Don't always listen to your agent <laughs> 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 or or anyone. Don't listen to anyone. Don't listen to your friends or your manager. You're like, do what you love. Go towards that. Don't don't strategize. Don't strategize it's your brilliant. career. It's so brilliant. It's don't so wise. Don't think if I do this, it'll lead to this and this. It doesn't work like it that. It doesn't work like it'll that. It'll always be the most unexpected turns. And is it, it's 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 just about instinct who do you want to play who are you interested in be curious and don't watch don't watch too many movies get out there see the world like go to art galleries um read extraordinary books escape learn about people be curious about people be empathetic it's the ultimate form of empathy and i mean don't watch too many movies because then you may Play something that's derivative of something you've seen or think you have to do something you've seen in a movie. It's like, stay curious, stay empathetic. It's brilliant, yeah. And then take How beautiful is that? That's so beautiful. I, mm, this is kind of a, a beauty. Um, and maybe, maybe one of our last ones here because it's kind of joyous. Um, <laughs> it's time for me to slap you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be in such trouble I can't even tell. Um, how do you define success? Ooh. Because it's a it's a loaded. It's there's so many. There's it's career, but it's life. You know how do yeah. you find how do you, do you find that for yourself? Who asked that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. That's a very wise woman there. Very wise woman. How do I define success? I'm sorry. It's such a pregnant pause. <laughs> um. We'll, we'll fix it in post. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it's, just, it, it's not cliched. It's fulfillment. Like if you feel fulfilled within yourself, um, it doesn't have to be defined as something. You don't have to have an opulent life. You don't have to have a yacht. If you are fulfilled, if you wake up, every day seeking a sense of awe and wonder, I think you have success. I think that if you lack stagnancy in your life, if you feel that sense of like effervescent aliveness, and if you love what you do, then you're successful. Thank oh you. my God, um, mm -hmm. That's why you are who you are. Can thank I just say right now, this is an extraordinary woman on every level, but thank you for everything. This love was so, so beautiful. Much. I love Ladies you and gentlemen, so much. Thank the you. extraordinary Emily Blunt. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for all of that. <laughs>